given my Italian and Greek background, this is really impeding having a mic. It means one hand is out of action. <laughs> hey? So if you see me doing this a lot, you, you know what's going on. Hey? When um, the welcome to country or the acknowledgement of country was offered, I don't know why, but it, it reminded me of that extraordinary photo of, of Goff with Vincent Lingiari, and some of you will remember it, where the hand was, the soil was picked up and handing the, the land back to the Gurindji, a photo by Merv Bishop, who was an indigenous photographer. Um, and it was the first time that land had been returned to indigenous people in 200 years since colonization. Now, what many people don't appreciate is that, in fact, Goff, characteristically, was being very referential because there's a painting uh, of 1834 here in Melbourne where John Batman enacted the transaction to acquire the lands on which this city is constructed. And the painting showed the elders with a bundle of soil in their hands, running it through their hands into John Batman's hand. And in fact, Goff symbolically was undoing that. Apart from being a good story, why it, why it occurred to me was because if we listen to what Lucy so powerfully has told us and what Peter explored in his school, the commonality it seems to me is that they're talking about rediscovering the humanity of education, the relationships that exist there, the connections that exist within a community of learners and with those with whom they are on that journey of learning, odd word journey, but in this case apt, it seems to me that what they're talking about is in fact the social that is at the heart of education. And I'll return to that. But it's tempting for us to think that we've lost the plot when we talk about education. There's so much time devoted to debates about education among our politicians, in the media, around the dinner tables, but you can't help but feel that it is all so much noise. The same old tunes on constant repeat. Track one, funding. Track two, testing. Track three, world rankings. Track four, standards. Track five, teaching performance, or lack thereof. Track six, disasters. There's so much noise that we forget that Gonski's review of school funding, oh, sorry, review of funding for schooling was as much about what lay behind the funding formula as the proposal itself. Gonski made the argument that there is much more to schooling than just academic success or academic skills. There was a reminder throughout the report in, of the 2008 Melbourne Declaration where all the Australian governments, on paper at least, agreed to focus on equity and excellence and on young Australians becoming successful learners, confident and creative individuals and active and informed citizens. There doesn't seem to be much acquitting of our success in that declaration. If you just take the active and informed citizens, we've done a lot of work at the Whitlam Institute about political participation by young people. 20% of 18 to 24 year olds either don't register or don't vote. I'm not sure that's a really good indicator of active informed decisions emerging from our school system. Addressing the impact of standardised testing, for example, Gonski warned us that the excessive focus on what is testable, measurable and publicly reportable carries the risk of an imbalance in the school curriculum. In his words, independence, confidence, initiative and teamwork are learned as much through elements of the curriculum that are not readily measured by an external test as through those areas in which outcomes can readily be tested and reported. Some five years later, it's pretty hard to find anyone who's really satisfied with how it's going. Until now, it's been well, know, well nigh impossible to find people willing to speak and look beyond the funding disputes to just ask, what is education really for? What are we trying to do with the education of our young people? And I think one of the great credits of Lucy's work and honesty is to make us remember that there is something much bigger than what we measure, in Ellen's words, which, what do we value? And there's a whiff of change in the air. I mean, her book, obviously, and her first um, newspaper report or press report um, clearly indicated that this is not one parent's story. This is a story of many, many thousands of parents. This is the story that is resonating in families, not just in this country, but elsewhere. 
A colleague that I visited today uh, who was involved in those reports on NAPLAN that we did told me how he, gave, he was asked to give a, a talk to um, the teachers' union in Italy about th those reports. And he was telling me how uh, throughout his presentation they were standing up clapping. You know, he was quite chuffed actually. Um, but um, hence why he told me, I guess. <laughs> but the reality was that these are issues that are resonating in countries across the world exacerbated perhaps in our own. But it makes you wonder whether the more we measure, the less we achieve. Taken at face value, the PISA data and NAPLAN results constantly being wheeled out by proponents of standardised testing and the high performing road to education suggests that the new and still growing testing regime, we're now talking about testing young kids even before they start school, is far from paving the way for higher performance, but it's been accompanied by a steady decline in educational attainment. And if that isn't sufficient cause for caution, then Lucy's perceptive account of the impact this is all having on Australian children should be. Her conclusion that there is something deeply disturbing going on with our kids resonates with our research on the impact of high stakes testing commissioned over several years. I won't go through all that research. Whitlam.org is the website. You can read it for yourselves. But our final report, conducted by Joanna Wynne and her colleagues down here at the University of Melbourne, um, found that NAPLAN undermines quality education, not just neutral, undermines quality education and is, in her words, not in the best interest of Australian children. The brunt of our collective failure is borne most directly by children and their families. However, the questions raised go to the heart of what we value and what sort of society we actually want. Lucy's already quoted one part of Plato from her, her book, um, but I was really struck with those Plato references. Um, the one that I had here is the highest goal of education is the knowledge of good. To nurture a man, that's Plato's word, to nurture a man to be a better human being. Dr Jeff Masters, who many of you know, is the CEO at the Australian Centre for Educational Research and has been since 1998, I think, reflects something of this changing mood in a paper he wrote earlier this year and the paper was titled, Is There Another Way to Think About Schooling? He leaves no doubt that he thinks the answer is yes. He calls on us to think differently about learning, about learners, about curriculum, what it means to teach, the role of assessment and reporting. In short, he says, to think differently about schooling itself. And the truth, as is evident from Peter's story, is that it's not all gloom and doom. In Australia, we have great examples of what teachers and schools can do for their students and their communities, and the more schools could do, given the chance. These examples, however, will remain but glimmers on the horizon if we are not prepared to challenge the prevailing assumptions about education and what it is for, and to open the way to refashioning our education system so that it genuinely puts the best interests of our children first. I love that formula, the best interests of the child. I love it because not only is it clear what it's intended, but it actually has legal force. It's actually the wording of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There is jurisprudence to support what it actually means and may well offer us a way forward in holding systems and governments accountable for what we're delivering for our kids. A first step would be to recognise that education is essentially social in nature and in intent. You get that right, and the economic benefits will follow. The question of competition, I would suggest, is a reflection of a particular view of society. It is a reflection of what we're imposing upon our education systems when we treat it as an industry. If we tackle what happens when we think about education in its social sense, in its human sense, then I think we can fairly say the high performance cheer squad have had their chance and have been found wanting. It might just be time to change the game.